Welcome to all of you out on YouTube as well, and welcome to those that have joined us uh, this evening in our in our Zoom room. This is our Made for More. Uh, in fact, I think our title is You Are Made for More. You Are Made for More. That's the theme of our four evenings. Hope to be inspiring talks through this month of November. And I think uh, myself, Alan, we've been, Father Alan, we've been wanting to do some talks and teaching and uh, put the word out there, the word of the Lord, especially in these difficult trying times of COVID. Um, we were looking for a theme. We were looking for, you know, I've been thinking about it for the last while. You know, what could we talk about and focus in on? And I was talking to the Queenship of Mary Sisters you're going to see them in a few minutes. They're going to sing us a little bit of worship this evening. I was talking to one of the sisters, John Paul Marie, and actually a few of them were there and asking, you know, for ideas, for a theme. And she kind of came up with that idea, that, that phrase, made for more. And just her sense was that, you know, we're not meant to just exist. God has something beautiful for us to, you know, some great adventure to live but oftentimes, you know, we feel, we feel there's something missing in our life. We feel there's an emptiness inside. We can have this either loneliness or emptiness or a sense that there's got to be more. And the very fact that we have that sense of emptiness or, or you know, of, 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 of uh, this desire for more already points to God. C.S. Lewis himself wrote about that, saying that that itself was kind of a proof of God's existence and really points, you know, the human heart to the eternal, right? To the eternal. And Father, Father Allen this evening is going to talk a bit about eternal life and our destiny and God's, God's plan and future, you know, purpose for us. And so, you know, as, as uh, Sister was talking about that theme, it just grabbed my heart and I thought, yeah, this would be a good topic to focus in on, that we are made for more. God has, you know, we're not just an accident of nature, uh, some freak collision of atoms in the universe. No, I've been created by God with a purpose you know, in my life. And that's a beautiful thing, which is reassuring, right? And I can walk in friendship with God every day. I can walk in a relationship with God where I am filled and renewed each day, you know, and I can participate in, in a great divine plan and mission for the world and the church. And so anyways, that's what we're hoping to talk about over the next few Tuesday evenings. So we got four Tuesdays booked in November, and it'll be from 7 to 8 p.m., as you've already seen the advertising, and uh, we're glad that you've been able to come and, and join us this evening. So I think right now we'll just go ahead and introduce the uh, Queenship of Mary sisters. So Dan, maybe you could uh, focus in on them there and pin their video, and uh, the Queenship of Mary are in Ottawa here, and they're a new community. There's about 15 sisters, and they all are, you know, in love with Jesus. They just have a great love for the Lord. They've got, they've got a great joy in their hearts, and you can see it in the smiles on their faces, you know. The <laughs> smiles, yes, look at the smile there, sister, uh, you know, reveal the joy, right? The, the, the external smile is a revel, you know, is a, a revealing of the deeper, deeper joy in their hearts because they really have discovered Christ in a powerful way. And the Lord has is, is, uh, just been doing beautiful things in all of their hearts and all of their lives. So they're going to lead us in a song right now just to get our hearts in the right place. Whenever we worship, you know, it puts our hearts in a right place with God. So let's, let's just enter into a time of, of, of worship. We're just going to have one song, but sister, you'll just play it, play a few <laughs> verses, keep it going, and, and then we'll just enter in. And then, and then we'll move into Father Allen is going to share the word of the Lord with us tonight. Thank you, Father Ben, and thank you, Father Allen. Welcome, everybody, and we're, we're glad to be with you to lead you in worship tonight. So I know that uh, you're maybe in your living room right now. There might be people running around, little kids running around, or else maybe it might be nice and quiet, but I just invite you. God is present with you right now. He's the one who has drawn you here to receive from him. He wants to give you more because you're made for more. 
because he wants to give you more. So I invite you even now just to open up your hearts. Maybe you have no clue who God is, and that's okay too. <laughs> I invite you just to maybe just come into a moment of being present, present to um, present and available to a new experience because you can't have more if you're not open for more. So I invite you just to open up your heart right now and listen if you if you might not know the song or if you know this song, you can sing along. And uh, we're just going to praise God because he's good and he's invited us to receive this gift. So bless the Lord. Thank you, sisters. Thank you so much for leading us in our time of worship here tonight. We do bless the Lord with all of our soul and with our voices as well. And so we thank you all for coming to participate here tonight. And we're going to, I'm just going to hand it over to uh, Father Allen, Father Allen McDonald, former General Superior of the Companions of the Cross. 
and uh, hails from St. Raphael's, Ontario. How long have you been with the community? 20 years. 20 years now with the community. And, and uh, so Father Allen has a great love for the Lord. And um, anyways, he's normally around the house wearing shorts all day, <laughs> even in the winter. But uh, he's wearing his full clerics tonight. So it's a kind of nice. He must feel this is very important. <laughs> and uh, really wants to give the word of the Lord to, to all of you. So without further ado, Father Allen, uh, you okay. take it away. Let's say a little prayer. So let's say a little prayer for Father Allen. Just ask you to extend your hands out, even through cyberspace. We just invite you, Lord, to bless Father Allen right now. Lord, put a deep peace in his heart. With the fire of your Holy Spirit in, in his soul, Lord, and, and, and the word, your word on the tip of his tongue, Lord, so that he can speak your word to, to all your people tonight, Lord. Open our hearts to receive all that he has to share, Lord. And so just be with us tonight. Lift us up. Lift our hearts. Encourage us this day, Lord. Be with us tonight as we share your holy word. And we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Through the intercession of Our Lady, pray for oh, us. us. Okay, thanks, Father Ben. Thank you very much, uh, sisters. Good to see see all of you here. I' looking at uh, the numbers here. Quite a few of you have uh, joined up tonight. Thank you very much for doing that from all across Canada. Some of our fellow uh, compatriots from across the can, and also a few from America, so you're all most welcome. I know that there's some options you have for this evening. You could be watching the U.S. election results, or you could be watching season five of This Is Us, but instead you've chosen to be here, so God uh, rewards you for that. I think Father Ben had mentioned that the, the theme of our four gatherings is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And you recall that in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is writing from prison. And he's writing this letter to uh, the people of Ephesus uh, from prison in order to, to strengthen them, to persevere, to persevere in, in the knowledge that Jesus can do much more in and through us than we can ask or we can imagine. And as, as we're journeying through life, but at this uh, difficult time in, in the whole world, it's important for us to really focus on that truth that Jesus is still the Lord and Jesus is able to do much more than we can ever ask, ever, ever possibly imagine we can do with our cooperation. And when I say yes to Jesus and I offer myself to Jesus every single day and allow him to do with me whatever it is he wishes to do with me, then that, that, there's a particular grace and anointing with that and great and amazing things are happening because great and amazing things are happening in the world, even though on the surface, you may look at things and think the whole thing is just going crazy, but it's not. The Lord is still very much in charge. And so in, in light of that, like how, how are we doing anyway? Like how, how are we really doing? Depending on the country you're coming from, or even the province, or the particular state that you're living in, you know, we still have these COVID-19 restrictions social limitations, family, friends, co-workers have been affected. Maybe we're experiencing some tiredness, some anxiety, fear even, like we're concerned. There's certainly a lot of political, economic, social tensions all over the world. Like, how are we doing with all this? Are we asking ourselves, like, where, where is the world heading? And what, what does the the immediate, even the long-term future look like? Like, will, will we ever get back to normal? Like, whatever normal was, we're we going to get back to that place where at least I felt as though things were normal. What, what does all this mean? What's it all mean for me? What's it all mean for my family? Well, the answer to each of those questions is not a, is not a something. The answer is a someone, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is, Jesus always will be the answer to all of our questions. And the Lord Jesus is still very much in charge. Like this COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic that we're all experiencing, God didn't cause this. He's allowing it to happen, but he didn't cause it. So why? why? Why would the Lord be allowing this to happen all over the world? I think in part it's it's his wake up call to each of us. He wants to wake us up to the reality of our absolute total need for him because we are completely totally powerless. 
so many of the institutions, the, the principles, the policies, the structures that we thought were rock solid, that we thought were going to last forever, that we thought were just going to just persevere and always have, we've, we've either had them taken away from us or we're not allowed to participate in, in them anymore. And we wake up to the reality that these things are not as solid as we thought they were. We don't have all the answers. We're completely, totally powerless. And how do I respond to that? How do I react to that? The truth of the matter is that we are made for more. We're made for more than simply this life. We are made for eternity with him. That you and I are the only creatures that God created simply for himself. And he created us so we can enjoy eternal life in perfect union with him. But what happened way back on day one? What happened? We, we revolted. We said, hey, you know what? I want to be God. And that was the whisper, wasn't it, of Satan into, into the ear of, of Eve and Adam, right? You can be like God. Hey, that's a pretty good deal. I want to be God. And so they took to themselves that which was prohibited to them and rebelled. And as a consequence of this rebellion, We've all fallen into the first pandemic in the history of the world is the pandemic of, of sin, the pandemic of original sin that we're all born into. So the world has experienced many pandemics, the first pandemic being born out of the, the virus of rebellion and sin entered into all of us. Bishop Durocher, who used to be the auxiliary here in Ottawa, who is now the, Arch the Bishop of Pembroke Diocese here in Ontario, he uh, likened uh, COVID-19 to, to sin. That sin it occupies our mind, it occupies our, our body, uh, our heart. And, you know, we're talking about COVID all the time, all the time, all the time. And it's constantly in our minds, constantly before us, in our, in our attention. So we're thinking about it, we're talking about it. We're drawn to, to it as we're drawn to, to sin. We, we can become attached, we become addicted to people, places, and things, all because we're weak and we're all prone to fall. We're all fallen human creatures. Father Ken Lau, who's the associate pastor at St. Mary's Parish here in Ottawa, he gave a talk back in the early days of the pandemic how there is another connection between, between sin and COVID-19 and, and sin isolates us, sin is contagious and sin is deadly, just like COVID-19. COVID-19 isolates us, COVID-19 is contagious and COVID-19 is, is deadly for some people. And so, you know, the, the sin, sin isolates us, right? The evil one's intention is always try to draw us away from others, get us isolated, <coughs> by ourselves, where we're susceptible and we're weak. And because of the contagious nature of COVID-19, we have various restrictions that prohibit us, discourage us from connecting with others. And so we spend a lot of time either alone or with the limited few other people. But the reality is we're never, always, we're never alone. Jesus is always with us. And there's this, the contagious nature of sin that sin is like a virus that spreads. If I'm living a life of vice, I, I pass that on to other people. If I'm living a life of virtue, then I can pass that on to other people as well. And COVID-19 uh, for some people with pre-existing conditions, etc., is very deadly. And sin is very deadly because sin ultimately wants to bring us to that place of eternal separation, eternal damnation from the Lord. And so what do we need to do? We need to avail ourselves of the, the, the vaccine of Jesus. This is, this is something that came to me recently. I don't, I don't claim to have any particular unique understanding of, of things. I may have heard something in the past and kind of just built on it from there. But I, I was celebrating mass a few weeks ago. Well, I, every day, but a few weeks ago particularly. And this, the idea came to mind that when we're standing, coming forward to receive Jesus in Holy Communion at Mass, what we're really doing is we're coming forward to receive Jesus 
in communion at Mass, and Jesus is the vaccine that we need against the pandemic of sin in our life. And I thought, you know, we, we stand in line, we come forward, we make this decision to receive the Lord Jesus in Holy Communion, just as we will one day, pray God, sooner than later, when the COVID-19 vaccine is available, we'll stand in line, we'll move forward, we'll roll up our sleeve, and we'll receive the, the vaccine against COVID-19. So think about that. You're standing in line, Holy Communion, we go to Mass, and I appreciate the fact that it's sometimes inconvenient. Celebrating Mass with a mask on and preaching with a mask on is, 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 is different altogether, right? But I, I want to receive the vaccine of Jesus against the, the virus of sin in, in my life, just as I want to receive the vaccine against COVID-19. And we, we have this vaccine who is Jesus. He's the vaccine against sin and its eternal consequences. And, and the Mass is our participation here on earth of the life that we are saved for by Jesus, his own death on the cross, for life with him forever in heaven. Like we're made for more than this. We're made for more than this life. We're made for eternal life. And more specifically, we are made to help as many people as possible come to also experience what it means to receive the, the vaccine of Jesus in their life too. We're made for more than life here on earth. And you and I have been saved by the same God who created us to live with him forever. And he desires us. He wants us to be with him forever. Now, I, I, if, if, you know, trying to put myself in, in the mind of the, of the secular person, like if I, if I have no power greater than myself, I have no understanding of my destiny other than life is just a whole series of events and I need more and more exciting things, more and more distracting things to get through life, well, then where am I going? The world, the world seems to be in a huge, big hurry to go where? Like, where are we going? We had, we had summertime, the summer months, then we had Labor Day, then we had Thanksgiving, then we had some people celebrating Halloween. Now what? Like, you wake up this morning in, in, in Ottawa, there's like four centimeters, almost two inches, for those of you from America, of, of snow on the ground, and it's cold. And they go, oh, oh my God. <laughs> Are we in for like five or six more months of this? Like, now what, right? Mm -hmm. The world seems to be this, this constant frenetic pace to kind of do something, chasing after one event after another, followed by another, but where are we ultimately going? And what are we ultimately looking for? Like everything, everything we have is passing away. The clock never stops ticking. Stop, the clock always moves forward. Now you say, well, yeah, you, you gain an hour in, in the fall, but you lose it in, in the spring, right? And so I think the Lord wants to inspire and encourage in us, particularly in light of what we're going through now, and, you know, we're, we, we're not the first people in the history of the world to go through a pandemic. It's not the history, not the first pandemic in the history of, of the church. But we're going through it now. And it's not easy. I, I appreciate that. And I, I can testify to that in my own life. There's many things I don't find easy. But am I willing to allow the Lord in the midst of all this to stir up inside of me an eternal perspective? to help, help me keep in mind the fact that there, I'm made for more than just this life. I'm made for eternal life. And I'm made to bring as many people as possible with me to encounter Jesus so that they too can have an experience of him and live with him forever in heaven. To have this, this eternal perspective. And one of the examples I use of, of having an eternal perspective from my own life is when I was in university um, back back in the 
the, the last century, the previous millennium, I was in university. And I, you know, before going to the seminary, I was, you know, I, I, I like good things, right? Nice things, particularly nice clothes. And I remember having this one particular shirt that was my favorite shirt. And it was a long sleeve, heavy cotton, button down collar shirt. And it, it, it fit beautifully. And I would wear it to parties and, and pubs and clubs, etc. And I would wash it, I would iron it, I would hang it up, it had its own place in, in the closet, you know, it didn't just flop on the back of a chair somewhere. I really cared a lot for that shirt. And it was a very nice shirt. And it was pink. It was a pink shirt. This is the, this is the, the 80s, right? And I love that shirt. And I really cared a lot for that shirt. <laughs> but wh where, where is that shirt now? Well, I have no idea. It's, it's long gone. It probably just chopped up and made into stuffing in someone's sofa. I, I like it, this, having this eternal perspective, like everything I have will one day be left to somebody else. Or most things I have will be used and passed on or forgotten about or thrown out. Do I have this eternal perspective? Like all that I have, like look around your apartment, your house right now, like what are we going to do with all this stuff? To have this eternal perspective, and I'm not against having things, right? We need things to, to live and carry out our ministry and duties, etc. Yes. But to have this eternal perspective, keeping in mind that I am made for much more than this. I'm made for much more than to wear this really nice fitting, perfectly tailored, <laughs> ironed, pink shirt, right? And even look at something even more immediate, like all the, the time and the attention, the, the posturing, the, the theorizing that's been going on about the outcome of an event in the United States of America that will soon pass into the history books. I just Googled some random presidential election information the other day to kind of make this point about how what we think is so important now, you know, does pass into the history books and future generations come along. And so here's, here's a skill testing question for, for all of you. Like we're like, this like, like Father Allen's version of Jeopardy. Um, who were the main candidates for US president in the 1848 general election? Anybody? Anybody? No? The 1848 U.S. presidential election. Who were the main two candidates? There were three, but who were the main two candidates? And what was so significant about the 1848 U.S. general election? Someone just wrote here, not a clue. That's right, right? Mm -hmm. Not a clue. Here are the two candidates, the two main candidates for the U.S. president in 1848 were Zachary Taylor for the Whigs, and Lewis Cass for the Democrats. And the significant thing about the 1848 US presidential election was that was the first election that was held statutorily on a Tuesday. And the winner of that election was Zachary Taylor. Who knew, right? That event was monumental. It was right after the American-Mexican War. He was a general in that war. Monumental election, but yet is passed on into history just like what we're experiencing right now, will one day pass on to history. To have this eternal perspective. You know, on Sunday, we celebrated All Saints Day, honoring all the, the unnamed saints. Some of our relatives, our friends, our benefactors. You know, a, 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 a saint, like a large S saint, or a small s saint is someone who enjoys the eternal vision of God. Whether you have a school named after you or a church named after you, or you're a small s saint, you're in heaven. And that's a good thing. Isn't that where we all want to be? We all want to go to heaven, which means we all desire and want to be a saint. We all need and desire to cooperate with the Lord. And all these saints, those who are officially canonized, those who are not, they, they, they point us, they point us and remind us of our ultimate goal, eternal life. 
That is our ultimate goal. We want to spend eternity. And where we spend eternity depends on our own choices and our behaviors and our actions. But we're, we're made for more than this. We're made for eternity. And I always think of the, the example of Father Bob Bedard, the founder of the Companions of the Cross, who, while a, a young man, had the intention of going to university to become a dentist. Now, no offense against dentists, we need dentists, right? But Father Bob was going to be a dentist. And he went to a parish mission, a Blessed Sacrament Parish here in Ottawa. And the preacher was talking about eternity. And the preacher said, imagine, if you will, a solid steel sphere the size of the earth. Now take a small little hummingbird. And once every hundred years, the, the wing of the hummingbird brushes up against that solid steel sphere the size of the earth. By the time the friction from the wing of the hummingbird on that solid steel sphere the size of the earth wears it down to a speck of dust, eternity has just begun. And that just like, like blew Father Bob's mind. He's like, why am I going to be a dentist? When the, the question is eternal life. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his immortal soul? And Father Bob made the decision to go to the seminary, to be a priest, to help people come to that point of accepting Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their life and going to heaven, become saints. Now, the, the, the ironic thing, I'll just add this as an aside, the ironic thing is that, you know, Jesus is never outdone by generosity. So Father Bob gave up his, his plan to be a dentist. But interestingly enough, when Father Bob was ordained, and after he had his own particular experiences, encounters with the Lord, and began to pray with people and pray over people, he discovered that the Lord gave him the particular gift of being able, through prayer, to heal people of their teeth issues, right? So it's like a spiritual dentist, right? So God, God's never outdone in generosity, right? So if God is calling you to do something, it might be kind of, okay, Lord, I'm not too sure about this, or this is going to mean I give up a lot of things. Don't worry. God's got your back. Okay, God will bless you abundantly in, in ways you may not even understand or fully comprehend right now. But it, it'll happen, right? Yesterday, now yesterday we celebrated the Feast of All Souls, uh, November being the month of the Holy Souls. And you recall in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, this is verses 43 to 45, um, it's reminded to us that it's a good idea, a holy practice, actually, to, to pray for the dead, that we can assist them with our prayers, our sacrifices, that the, the merits of Jesus' act on the cross uh, are applied to their life, and they can enter into the joy of eternal life. For, for many of us, many of you, myself, life's hard. Life can be hard and can be difficult, particularly at this time. And it's a time in when, when our faith can be tested, like, Lord, what are you doing? And we can have a whole myriad of <clears throat> personal, some family problems, and life can sometimes be seemingly unfair. Maybe we think we're doing something wrong. What am I doing wrong? Why do I have so much difficulty? Why am I, am I, am I being punished by the Lord? Why can't I control this? Well, the truth is that this isn't heaven. Why is life hard? Why are there obstacles? Why are there setbacks? Why are there disappointments? It's life, and this ain't heaven. But the church, in her wisdom, points out to us certain individuals who remind us, and who are in many ways no different than you and me, that they remind us of keeping an eternal perspective, taking advantage of the opportunities that are right here in front of us, 
you're here. Praise God for that. You're taking advantage of this opportunity to allow the Lord Jesus to minister to your heart, to calm your mind, inspire and encourage you, to give you the grace as St. Paul asked when he wrote that letter to the Ephesians from prison, experiencing his own hardships, that they would have the grace to persevere. And just keep in mind the fact that the Lord is able to do much more than we ask or imagine, because he's God and we're not. But the, the, the saints, the, the blesseds, encourage us to taste already the life that we're being offered. Recently, there were two beatified, Michael McGivney, the, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, now blessed Michael McGivney. And another one was blessed Carlo Aculis, Carlo Aculis, A-C-U-L-I-S, essentially declared the patron saint of the internet. 15-year-old whiz kid, computer geek, genius guy, who spent his brief life really promoting all the Eucharistic miracles that have happened throughout the history of the world on the internet and really promoting, you know, devotions, promoting decision to, to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life it was really cool. He was just recently beatified back in October. He was, he's laid to rest in, in Assisi and they open up his, his, his coffin for public veneration and he he's dressed in like a, like a like a, a sports um, athletic clothes, you know, with jeans and Nike running shoes, which was the favorite thing he liked to wear. It was just, it's just it's just so amazing. It's just so beautiful, right? I had this this modern young guy who dedicated his life, his short life. He died of leukemia, and. He's now an, an example that we can look to and say, you know what? Well, he's not much more different than me. So, you know what? God's grace is possible. It's possible. It is possible to become a saint, right? In 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 the, in the world today, to persevere in the life that the Lord calls us to. But again, it's not. It's not. Life's not easy, and I don't find life easy sometimes. And so, in these in these difficult times, there are three particular passages from Scripture that I turn to. To, to focus on the, the eternal goal of life, which is to be, God, to be with God in heaven. And the, the three particular scripture verses I, I turn to, uh, the first is, if you have your Bibles, or you can just jot down the scripture reference for future, look, future need and use, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run, that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable crown. But we an imperishable crown. So why do I do the things that I do? You know, our motives are not always pure. Sometimes we do things in order to be draw attention to ourselves, to receive acclaim and affirmation and applause from others. But really, all I do, the sacrifices that I undertake, the decisions I make, Pray God give us the grace to keep it in mind that we're doing this for an eternal prize, the eternal gift, the, the eternal benefit, the eternal blessing of life with the Lord forever. Like forever. As soon as that hummingbird burns that solid steel sphere down to, the speck, to a speck of dust, eternity has just begun. That's a long time. The second scripture passage that I call to mind when things are a little bit tough, don't always go my way, <laughs> which is life, I guess, eh? Many times. <laughs> is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. In this you rejoice. Well, now, for a little time, 
you may have to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Without seeing him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy as the outcome of your faith, you obtain the salvation of your souls. How, do, how does the silversmith know when the silver has been thoroughly purified? When he or she is able to see their face in the reflection of the silver? I'm not going to be full of purified until I see the Lord face to face. He sees his face in me and I see my face in him. The third scripture passage that I try to keep in mind when life takes a bit of a turn is John chapter 16, verses 20 and 22. John 16, 20 and 22. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Nobody, nobody, no thing can take joy from me. Here's something that my, my spiritual director says to me. He says, Alan... Do you believe that nothing outside of yourself needs to change for you to be happy? What? <laughs> Here's my list of things that need to change. Nothing outside of you needs to change in order for you to be happy. Just think about that. I think if you took all these three passages and, and boil them down and try to find a, a common denominator, it would be this simple expression. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. To keep this eternal perspective, I'm made for more than this. Our Holy Father Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth, at one of his one of his first homilies, he gave as as Pope. He said that we are not some random occurrence of evolution. We are each of us a direct willed thought of God. A direct will thought of God. Our parents came together. The two became one flesh. And nine months later, that flesh was born and given a name. My name, your name. And that's the name we're going to be known forever, eternally, like in heaven. So I hope, I hope you like your name. <laughs> but you're going to have that name forever in heaven. Right? And our Holy Father, at a, at a later date, Benedict XVI, at a later date, said that in regards to our Blessed Mother, she urges us to, quote, raise our gaze toward heaven. It's not a heaven of abstract ideas or an imaginary heaven created in art, but the true reality of heaven, which is God himself. Heaven is God, our goal. He is the dwelling place from which we came and toward which we are going. All of us want happiness, and that happiness is found in God. Our everyday lives, although marked by problems and difficulties, flow like a river toward the divine ocean, toward the fullness of joy and peace. Well, since I'm made for more than this, since I'm made for eternity, since I'm made to be with the Lord forever, with him in heaven. And since my first parents rebelled and said, I want to be God, and we were separated from the Lord, and we couldn't get back to him, he sent his son Jesus to die in our place, the atoning sacrifice. So now we're united again. We can be united back again with our Father in heaven. And shouldn't I want to get to heaven and go there ASAP, like A-S-A-P, get me, get me to heaven. 
take me now. I want to be there. Right? Well, St. Saint, Saint Paul had that desire as well. And he wrote to the people of Philippi, talking to them about this, this desire he had in his own heart uh, to be with the Lord. And this is how he expresses it. It's Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 to 24. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 to 24. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If it is to be life in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account, he says to the people of Philippi, and by extension to you and to me. What, what St. Paul is basically saying there is, yes, I have a earnest yearning and a desire to go to heaven. I want to get there ASAP. But the Lord has a particular mission and role for me to play in the advancement of the gospel. So as many people as possible can come to have that same experience of a life lived, focus, focused on eternity. And St. Paul had that mission, and each of us has that mission. Each of us here this evening has a particular mission, a particular role to play in bringing as many people as possible to a lived experience of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to live eternally with him in heaven. Nobody can say, well, that's just not, I, I, no, that's not, that's not for me. It is. Now, what your particular role is, is unique to yourself, as mine is unique uh, to me. So we're made for more than this, this life, and made for more than just to get ourselves to heaven. We're called to bring people with us. And what we're experiencing as a people now, because of this pandemic, is really an opportunity to, to witness to others. And my prayer is that something that the Lord has inspired me to say is resonating in your heart, and you can testify to others about it especially in, in this time. There's a lot of uncertainty, confusion, fear, anxiety. And, and I get it because I experience it in my own life. I'm not immune to this stuff. The, 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 the true purpose, the, the meaning, the direction of life. People, people are hungry. They're, they're questioning. They're wondering. They're, they're searching. They're available to be evangelized. They're available to be evangelized. As much as the Lord wants this to happen, the evil one too, he's trying to stir up as much trouble as he possibly can. And there, there is an obstacle in the spiritual life. There's an obstacle to living an enthusiastic spiritual life, a Christian life, a Christian witness, a Christian life of a witness. There's a major vice in our day that we need God's grace to guard against. Many of our contemporaries, many of us, we're, we're tempted by it. It's, it's a vice that can rob us of our true identity of being made for more. And it's, it's the vice of acedia. You don't hear a lot about this in, in these days. It's the vice of acedia, A-C-E-D-I-A, -E acedia, sometimes referred to as the noonday devil. And if you're looking for a, a good book uh, to read about acedia, I suggest this one here. I'll hold this up here for you to see. Father Jean-Claude Noe's book on the noonday devil, Acedia, the unnamed evil of our times, acedia. Acedia is, in Father Noe's definition, acedia is a form of sadness. It's a sin against joy, a gloominess, weariness, a dejection, a sadness, discouragement, 
It can also be a disgust with everything, particularly things spiritual, um, a melancholy, a boredom, a sloth, mediocrity, being down, um, loss of meaning, loss of purpose, ultimately leading to despair. And it is characterized by a perpetual need for change, a frenzy of, of novelty, a horror of anything that's lasting, a horror of staying in one place. It's, it's, a, it's a continual gliding from one thing to another, a craze for travel, a craze for instability. It's, it's a dejection of things passing beyond, sticking rather to things passing through, Father No talks about this in his book. It's, it's a vice. It's a vice that really is contaminating our culture today. And to be perfectly honest with you, as I always try to be, I, I can recognize its propensity in my own life. The evil one's always trying to take us out, right? He doesn't want us to be effective in our mission. John Cassian, who was a fourth century monk and, and mystic, he says that Acedia has eight daughters <laughs> the eight ugly daughters the ugly ducklings of, of acedia the vice of acedia laziness sleepiness peevishness that is being irritated by unimportant things uh, restlessness vagrancy that is kind of idly walking around from place to place instability of mind and body garrulousness that is excessively talking about stupid things trivial matters and curiosity it's the vice of acedia can i can i identify in my life any areas where i may have fallen or am succumbing to the the vice of of acedia particularly in light of what we're going through in the world today a discouragement, a despondency, uh, hopelessness, chasing after one thing after another, just kind of like, what's the next big thing coming? Like, I need a party, like, I got to get out of here, what, what, whatever it is, right? We just got to pray that the Lord Jesus, in his power, in his name, would just release us of any way in which we are bound to the vice of acedia. And St. Thomas Aquinas he says that one of the remedies against acedia is to meditate on the incarnation. That is the birth of Jesus. And we're soon to enter into the season of Advent in anticipation of celebrating Christmas. So it's to meditate on the incarnation that Jesus restores us to hope. It's the hope of being able to participate fully in the divine life. It's the joy of being saved. Jesus Christ took on human flesh. Jesus Christ was born in time and place to save me. And the beginning of that process of me being saved was Jesus being born, walking among us, dying on the cross in my place to save me. So when I meditate on the incarnation, knowing that I can experience more, that I'm made for more, I'm made for eternal life, and I'm made to bring as many people as possible with me to evangelize them, to have their own particular experience, as did I, of the Lord Jesus active and alive in my life. And each of us here this evening has a particular role to play in that, has a particular unique way to cooperate with that. Don't, don't fall into the temptation to compare. Just ask yourself, where do I identify? Where do I identify? Where, can, where does this apply to my life? Where can I see this active alive in my life? And what I want to do now is I'm going to invite the sisters to participate with me here to, <clears throat> to lead us in a, in, a, in a brief period of prayer ministry that the Lord would stir up in our hearts that particular word, particular sentence, or maybe a scripture passage, uh, something that I've mentioned here this evening, the Lord will just really allow that to sink into our hearts, into our memories. And it would, at this very moment, uh, germinate and begin to produce fruit 
And particularly, I'm going to say a prayer of renunciation uh, against the spirit of acedia. In any way, it has infiltrated into our into our mind, into our speech, into into even our body, right, physically. I invite us to take a moment now, just maybe just put aside, you know, put aside your notepad or your pencil or your cup of tea or whatever beverage you got working on there. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of fun. I, I don't, uh, I, I can't see you guys. I know, I think you can see me. So your various uh, homes, your apartments, whether you're by yourself or whether you're with a loved one or some friends. Whoever's in your social bubble. <laughs> so we take a moment now just to recollect ourselves, just to calm our hearts, just to empty ourselves, maybe just open our hands. Whether on the, the, the arm of our chair or whether in our lap, just to open our hands, which is a gesture of receptivity. The Lord Jesus. We just thank you once again for bringing us here together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift of each of my brothers and sisters here. You know, Lord, what is on our heart, what is in our minds, what we've been talking about, thinking about. We just want to make a decision right now, Lord, to surrender our whole selves over to you. Any fears, any worries, concerns, any loneliness, any anxiety, any questions, Lord, that we have about what's going on in the world. We just want to surrender all that over to you. Give it to you, Lord. Lord Jesus, not to go looking for it again. That you would speak to each of our hearts right now, Lord, and remind us that you indeed are the Lord, that you are still in charge. Nothing's happening, Lord, in our life or in the world without you knowing about it. Help us, Jesus, to surrender our own plans, our own ideas of how we think things should happen, how things should go. Help us, Jesus, to trust that you do have a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. Jesus, we want to give you our yes. Give you permission, Lord, to use us however you wish. Jesus, pray that you would speak to our hearts and help us to answer the question, Lord, what would you have us do? Lord, how would you have us serve you and others today? Lord Jesus, I command in your name anyone here living under the burden, living under the duress of the spirit of Asidia, that I command you, spirit of Asidia, in the name of Jesus, to be gone. I cast you out, Asidia, in the name of Jesus, from the heart, the mind, the body of each of us here present tonight. And I command you in the name of Jesus to go to the foot of the tabernacle and wait there until you are told by Jesus where you are to go. I command you in the name of Jesus to be gone. You have no place, no right to occupy any place, any space in the hearts of all of us here. Lord Jesus, in this place, I invite you in your grace and your mercy to fill us up 
with the virtue of faith and hope and charity, Lord. Lord Jesus, we just renounce and we ask forgiveness for any ways which we have allowed the spirit of Asidia to enter into our life. We renounce any and all forms of discouragement and doubt, questioning and despondency and chasing after people, places and things to find satisfaction in life. Help us, Jesus. Help us to remember that you and you alone are the satisfaction of each and every desire and hope of our heart. And Lord Jesus, help us to go from this place now with new and renewed enthusiasm and optimism. That you would help us, Lord Jesus, already. That you would begin to work to stir up in our hearts and our minds the word or words that we can speak to our families and our friends and our contemporaries who are in need of a word of encouragement and love and peace and courage. We thank you already, Jesus. Even before we know what you want to do with us, we say thank you. Mother Mary, St. Joseph, St. Martin of Porres, your feast day today. Please pray for us. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, already for the miracle transformation that you are doing in each of our lives right now, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
experiencing any shame right now just to open up your hands and hand that over spiritually to Jesus just say I give it to you Lord Jesus that is not the voice of Jesus he speaks to us in love he speaks to us as his children so I just invite you to hand over any shame right now and Lord Jesus in your name I ask that you just come right now and touch these people touch each one of us with your deep love your sweet love the love that brings us life, the love that brings us fullness of life, this fullness of life that wells up into eternity. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is Thank you so much, uh, Queenship of Mary Sisters, for leading us in that beautiful worship time. Uh, thank you, Father Allen, so much as well for your very inspiring words. Awesome, awesome word, you know, that eternal perspective, Lord. Give us that vision for our future, for our, our, our lives, Lord, so that we would not get caught up in the things that are passing away, but see always, uh, Lord, your kingdom before us. And Lord, lift that stuff off of us, that discouragement, that sadness, especially here in the, uh, I th thank you so much for that, uh, Father Allen. That's, uh, that's spoken to my heart as well. So we're going to send you off now. It's been good to be with you tonight. I hope you've enjoyed your time. And uh, we're going to meet again next week, 7 o'clock, Tuesday next week. And uh, looking forward to having many of you back or all of you back, plus some more as well. So have a lovely evening and uh, we'll see you next week. The Lord be with you. With your May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace and the joy of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Have a good night. God bless you.